Hello everyone, how are you doing today? Um, for some reason the intro thingy didn't want to play, but of course it didn't because things. Hello, how are you doing? And welcome to my channel. My name is Charlie. You might know me better as sci-fi fantasy writer C.E. Dorset. I've been doing this for way too long, it feels like sometimes. And I'm going to be talking to you today about magic systems. And I am really excited to be doing this. And hopefully we will learn something and it will be an interesting time had by all. So let's get started. The format I'm going to be doing today is primarily I am going to be talk I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the basics in magic and magic systems. And then I would like, if possible, to open it up to questions because there's a lot of content out there and I think it would be much better for y'all if we could just address some of the issues or questions that you all have. So, alrighty, <laughs> are we ready? Whew. I'm sorry, I'm just having a day today. It's been a good day, but you know, one of those things. Let's say hello to a few people in the chat. So Jules is here and so excited. And Devin pointed out that she can't just can't hide it. Stephanie, um, see, Stevie is here. I believe I pronounced that properly. I hope I did. I hate mispronouncing people's names. So if I did, I apologize. LR is here, and I see Kat is here as well. Alrighty. So without any further ado, I'm going to say. Honestly, if you want deep dives into any of these subjects, there are two places that you can go. One is to my own podcast, Myth Weaving, which is available on most podcast engines everywhere. If it is not, it should be. So please let me know if you find if it's not on your favorite podcast app of choice, and I will fix it and get it there. The second one is the channel Hello Future Me, which I am putting a link to in the chat right now which is run by Tim Hicks, and he has a wonderful book on world building out, as well as a lot of very, very good resources on each of these topics, which gets, he drills down really, really well into each and every one of them. He has an entire series on magic systems, starting with hard magic systems, soft magic systems, hybrid magic systems, bending as a magic system, all of those wonderful things. And hopefully you can, Find your answers there. That's awesome. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm so. I, I I get really nervous because I'm I am bad at the pronunciation sometimes. So creating magic systems. The first question you should ask yourself before starting to make a magic system is why does this story need a magic system? Most people don't start there. Now, when I say that, some people think I'm being combative and making it sound like, oh, so maybe I shouldn't write the fantasy story that I'm wanting to write. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is, ask yourself why. What is the purpose of having a magic system in this story? What is the purpose of having magic in this story? Because once you can nail that down, you're actually going to have the seeds for most of the answers that are going to follow. In fact, about three episodes back, I think it was, I spent an entire episode on this in the World Building 202, um, 201 series on the Myth Weaving podcast. So there are a lot of things that you can ask yourself, but when you're trying to think of why, ask yourself, is the magic going to be indicative of how emotions are interplayed? Are they? Is it going to... To demonstrate something about the cultures and people that we're meeting. Is it simply there because it looks cool and it's fun to write? All of those are valid answers. So whatever your answer is, do not, don't judge yourself for it. Whatever you want to use the magic for, that's fine. But make sure you know why you want it there. Because honestly, if you just want the magic to be there because it's cool and it's fun and it's exciting... Knowing that means that the magic system that you create and the stories that you want to tell with it are also fun and exciting. Okay, 
the purpling has happened. It is that time of day. All right. So I'm just going to like roll with it because I thought I turned that off, but I didn't. But the purpling has occurred. All right. So now that we have asked ourselves, why do we want to have magic in our stories? We need to start asking ourselves, what is a magic system? By magic system, I mean the basic rules by which magic is used in your system, in your story, in whatever you're creating. Magic systems can be easily seen in something like a video game or a tabletop role-playing game where the rules are very clearly spelled out. Some TV shows and movies, not so, so much. When you're looking at a magic system, you will have either a soft magic system, a hard magic system, or a hybrid magic system. What does that mean? Hard magic systems are essentially creating your own metaphysics. Brandon Sanderson is a big, big fan of hard magic systems. And I highly recommend, if you want to do those, check out his YouTube channel where he talks about that quite a bit. I am not a fan of hard magic systems for several reasons. One, they take an extremely long time to explain to your readers, which slows down the narrative and can cause you to lose their attention and their interest. Number two, they can pin you into a corner as a writer. Once you have established a rule in a hard magic system, you should never break it. Because in so doing, you have violated the trust of your readers, and you're going to lose a chunk of them at that point. I prefer soft magic systems, or more honestly, hybrid. A soft magic system can range any from anything like the magic in Harry Potter, which has no rules. Don't at me. I've read the books many, many times. There are a few things that are spoken of of what magic can and cannot do, but if you actually watch the progression of the stories over time, magic does whatever it is needed to do for the plot and cannot do whatever it needs to do for the plot, and rules are supplied accordingly. Not a bad thing, but there was not a consistent magic system worked out at the beginning of those stories. Other soft magic systems are every vampire story. How does the blood work? How do people get transferred over? Especially if you're not dealing with a story where it's a magical contagion. Okay? Soft magic systems have fewer rules and do not establish a complete cosmology. They do not have a completely worked out metaphysics that explain every little detail of how they work. Now, Star Wars is a really good example of this. How does the Force work? Well, there's a spooky energy force out there that is created by all life, and it moves through all life, and it penetrates us, and it moves through us. It guides our actions and can respond to our commands. Those basic rules establish everything else that flows in the Star Wars universe. Very good example of a soft magic system. You should always, always have rules. The worst thing that you can do in a fantasy story is have a, an action happen because, simply put, a wizard did it. If a wizard did it, and that's the only reason it happened, and there's no way for your readers to understand why it happened, it is no better than a deus ex machina, and you will lose readers. <laughs> so establish rules, and establish them early, often, and consistently. Consistency is the most important thing when you're developing a magic system. I personally use what I call the three rules of three to make all of my magic systems. They're very simple. Now, the number three is a stand-in. You don't have to have just three, but you should have a minimum of three. Always keep it an odd number. Odd numbers are easy to remember. So what are the three rules of three? When you're creating your magic system, ask what three things can magic do? There will be at least three things. You can be as broad as you want in that it can tell the future, it can cast spells, and it can uh, enchant items. Three things. Very simple, very broad, allow for a lot of leeway. Or you can be very specific. In Avatar The Last Airbender, they would actually have four rules here or technically five, if you really want to think about it. Magic can bend earth, 
bend fire, it can bend air, it can bend water, and it can bend spirit. Those are the, that's it. That's what magic can do. Them's the rules. Whatever it is, however it works for your, your system, your world, make it clear. Try to keep it in an odd number because it's easier for people to remember. Rule number two. In what three ways can magic be accessed? This is important. Let's go back to Avatar The Last Airbender, shall we? Because it works really well here. What three ways can magic be accessed? Through katas, through physical motions of your body, which move the chi through your body to then cause the bending effect. Number one. Number two, the breath. We see many, many styles of bending that can be used exclusively through the breath, including both fire bending, air bending, and even one water bending technique that shows up. The third way that they can be used is through sheer concentration. We see this from Boom Boom Guy being able to do it. We see Toph learning how concentration allows you to focus on metal, making metal bending possible, and many other ways as well. So there are the three ways in which magic can be accessed. There may only be a few, but more than likely you'll have at least three, maybe more. Okay, and the third rule of three, what three things can magic not do? Can it bring back the dead? Can it cause people to fall in love with each other? What three things can magic not do? And that could be anything not stated above. So, so for example, in Avatar The Last Airbender, pretty much anything not stated before uh, in the what it can do, it can't do. It can't do anything else. So what are you doing? It's very simple. And take this as your initial rules, your initial grain of salt in how you want to build your world. Because once you have these three set up, you have a function mag magic system. You know what it can do, you know how it's accessed, and you know what it can't do. Once you have those things nailed down, you have a magic system. That's it. That's all you need to answer. Those three questions. And you need to be able to convey the, the answers to those three questions as simply and easily to your readers as possible. And that's why I like to keep it simple. All right. So that's my tried and true method for doing this and why I can pontificate for a long time if needs be, but I would like to have some questions because I think this would be a lot better, would serve y'all better if I were able to actually answer some of your questions specifically. So, hello, Stephanie. Hello, Tamama. How are you doing today? Because magic should be used in your settings for so many more things than just casting spells. You really... See, what I think authors need to be doing right now, especially if you want to be an interesting writer to read, is taking as much time and energy as you can to innovate in how magic is, is used. This is one of the reasons I think Avatar The Last Airbender has been such a... Oh, fine, I'll say it. A force in the fa fantasy world because the combination of magic of magic and martial arts is such a brilliant visual style and technique that while you can see predecessors of it in the wuxia and especially the um 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 the jiangsha fiction that you see in china outside of that market there aren't weren't a lot of people that were already exposed to it so by allowing it to be innovated in that way brought a lot of new life into the story. So uh, having a good twist on how magic can be evoked can be fun or being very traditional with it. I think one of the reasons Harry Potter resonated with people as strongly as, I d as it did was the nostalgia, the, just the pure nostalgia that it brought into its magic system. Wizards literally wear robes and have pointed hats. They literally use wands. They're using cauldrons to do their wizard's brews. 
And in seeing that nostalgic take on magic, that allowed people to key into it a lot quicker and a lot easier. Which style is going to work best for you? What one are you wanting to do? What's a way that you could do magic that you haven't really seen before? Because honestly, don't strive too hard for originality. Because honestly, since anime exists, <laughs> since anime, I mean, this is where we have to be honest, right? Since anime, manga, comics, and the plethora of independently published books exist, it's going to be really difficult, if not impossible, to actually come up with an a original idea, a purely original idea that no one has done before. So don't strive too hard for that. And don't spend too much time trying to... <sighs> okay, this is kind of a spoiler for Wednesday, Wednesday's podcast, but don't... <laughs> Don't spend too much of your time, energy, and effort trying to define your magic. Don't do it. It, it is one, a waste of your time. Mainly because while it's good for you to know, if you are not conveying those rules in some way, shape, or form to your readers, because this is the golden rule of world building. And it's the one thing that hopefully everybody has brought up at some point throughout this that has discussed world building. No picks didn't happen. If it does not appear in the story, it doesn't, it didn't happen. It doesn't matter. It's not real. So if you come up with a thousand rules for how magic works and only two of them actually get exhibited in your story, you spent a lot of energy and a lot of time making rules that are never, ever going to matter. So be careful. Be very careful waste, wa wasting energy where it's not going to be seen. Uh, who is one of my favorite hybrid magic system authors? Mm. See, I want to cheat. <laughs> I want to cheat with this one. Um, mainly because I would... the, the Okay. So the first person who came to mind when you asked my favorite hybrid magic system author is Neil Gaiman. And namely because Sandman. And I, it's because I'm rereading Sandman right now. And it is very much a hybrid magic system. In that we have rules very clearly established. When we first meet Dream, we are told that his magic comes from his being, that the Eternals, when they came into being, possessed all possibility. And those possibilities were divided amongst them. So Dream can control all of the domain of the imagination. We're told this very clearly. We're also told that his power resides specifically in his three ensigns of power and how they are used and how he lost them into the world. And this is the beginning of Sandman, is him running around and collecting them. This is a very hard magic system. Dream cannot do anything because he does not have access to these powers that he locked away. But as he gets them back, we start to see the softness of the magic system. We meet well, once we meet death and the various devils of hell, we start seeing how that isness that defines magic has a certain malleability to it. And the rules that we learned are still 100% true because that's what makes for a good hybrid magic system is that the rules have to remain 100% true and at the same time be soft. I will say the worst the absolute worst hybrid magic system I've ever seen was in Dick, um, Terry Goodkind's books because he established rules, very hard and fast rules for how magic could be used. And then as soon as it did not aid in the plots that he wanted, he threw them out the window. He just threw them completely out and was like, well, we just didn't know what magic was. And... There's a real hard shift in his books for a lot of reasons. But yeah, I 
that one's easy. The, the, the worst hybrid that I've ever seen because he went from hard to soft. Let's see, what is one ma one magic rule or magic trope you wish was not so prevalent? Um, magic that all magic has. So <laughs> this is going to be a bit controversial. I don't think that magic should be free. I'm not. I'm not arguing that magic should be free, but uh, there was a trend starting. I th I saw it first in the late '90s. Start creeping in and build from there. This idea that all magic has a cost. Okay, that's fine. But that then became this very burdensome idea of oh, magic has a cost. And it's not so much the rule that I don't like, it's the way it's kind of become this trope of so everything that we want to do is going to slowly destroy us or hurt us or bring damage to the world because they're trying to analogize to other things. You see this very awkwardly done in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, for example, just trying to use television because it's easier and more likely that people have read since most of the books that I would be referencing um, are not very commonly read. Um, Willow can use magic willy-nilly until plot needed it not to, and then all magic has a cost, and we have Evil Willow, and then... Evil Willow gets resolved and we can now use magic willy-nilly again. And that that plot line is kind of indicative of how this shows up in a lot of fiction where because we want to just make it hard for magic to happen, we say, but all magic has a cost. And then we make the cost something ridiculous that then when it's no longer convenient for it to be, it goes away. That, that, that's that's one that I really have a hard time with because it it happens too much um I yeah so that, that that's probably the one that I wish wasn't used quite so much yeah I should leave my glasses on but it's really catching reflection from the screen today and it's bothering me let's see Tamama says at what at what point would an ability, not be a part of a magic system. Okay, see here, I would say the X-Men are a magic system. Anything that you're doing, and this is where I would invoke Asimov's law, right? Any technology sufficiently advanced would appear as magic to other people. So even if you're creating like a Star Trek fairly grounded, or even I would say, more the expanse, very grounded world, you still have a quasi magic system in those settings where you have to explain the woo woo technology that we don't have. That's still a magic system because as far as we know, it's impossible to go faster than light, though somebody figured it out. As far as we know, you can't do warps in space and time, but somehow somebody figured it out. That's still a magic system and should be treated accordingly. So, when you're doing your mutant powers and say something like the X-Men, and this is where the X-Men can, can either work or not work. And the same with most superhero stories, you need to establish parameters. Ma the the, the be most important thing that a magic system, when you create it does, is it should prevent you from having power creep in your story. By delineating what magic can do, how it's accessed, and what it can't do, you are setting caps on where it can go. And you don't end up like DC Comics had the other day. And well, what was that? Last year, a year before last, where Superman learned he could uh, expel all the solar power from his body in one giant like atomic bomb. That's power creep. Superman was already the strongest hero on Earth. And now... He can just be like, nope, wa-boom, and just destroy everything around him. Like, that's ridiculous. But they don't have rules that ground and govern what his powers can do. And thus, the power can continue to e escalate and grow and get insane. So when you're doing your rules, you should be doing them with that in mind. A good magic system always puts a cap on what can happen. 
And limits really are important for allowing your imagination to work well, because the more confines you have to work within, the more creative you have to be to make the story work. If you can't just have a wizard do it, then you have to figure out within the established rules how to make it happen. And I, I, I yeah. So I, 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 I would definitely, if I were writing something like the X-Men, and trust me, I've thought about it. I have a superhero idea that I've been thinking about doing for a while. I would definitely create a magic system for mutant powers or superpowers because if you don't do that, there's no consistency. And while that can be fun to a certain degree, if your audience doesn't know what to expect, any power that comes from nowhere or any saving act that a hero can perform that comes out of nowhere will turn off your readers. It all has to be established. And the easiest way to do that is within the system itself before you build into the story. And also by building it into the system itself, it's easier to not give away the ending because when you get to the ending and people are like, how did that happen? And then you just have somebody reiterate the rules of magic that were established earlier and they go, oh, it's a good way to hide it in plain sight, sight as well so that you can set it up and not have it just be like, oh, wait, what? Because you don't want that to happen. Yeah, the covenant as well. Um, you recently attended a Zoom conference about magic systems, and Sarah Rash said she preferred the rule. The, the rule, magic has limitations over magic has a cost. That's actually a really good way to put it, because even if, say, magic required blood or life to occur, which is often how those magic has a cost systems work, then the limitation is what are you willing to sacrifice for the magic to happen? That could be for an interesting story, but th there's been some weird, there's just been some weirdness with that, you know, all magic has a cost trope that I have not, I have not thoroughly enjoyed. What are your thoughts on having factions like an alchemy tower and a mage's tower? Okay. So, I talked about this a little bit during Glory's panel yesterday. I I am not a huge fan of science versus magic argumentation in fantasy literature. And I'm not for two reasons. One, there there one is just a history of misogyny that that often entailed and came from where anything that was considered a feminine art was deemed witchcraft and anything that was deemed a masculine art was deemed science. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, look at the history of brewing in Northern Europe and, and in England and the history of midwifery or midwifery, however you wish to pronounce that word. These were both deemed magic and witchcraft for a long time because they were feminine acts and the male acts of see, they didn't even change the name of brewing. They just started calling the beers and tonics and stuff that women used to make. They just started calling them potions because they were just you know, they weren't real, you know, only, only, only real men can make a beer. And so I, I get a little frustrated just because of the history of that. Two, I, I am not a fan of the myth of disenchantment. I don't think that these ideas are mutually exclusive. I think there's a lot of interesting science out there to show how they overlap. Now, having said that, I do not have a problem with competitive schools of magic. In, was it Jack? I think it was Jack Campbell's Pillars of Reality world. There are two guilds that are fighting for the world. There are the Engineers Guild and the Mages Guild. And that they are essentially, at their heart, machinists in the Engineers Guild and people who can use magic in the Mages Guild. And, oh, I don't want to give any spoilers for the series. 
But over time, you learn that the differences between them were instituted more to keep them from working together so that powerful elites could maintain their power than for because they're actually opposed ideologies or opposed systems. It's a really interesting series of books. And if you haven't read them, I, I, I highly recommend them. I, I love them so, so, so much. But having competitive schools of magic are very interesting. I just, I think, I think you have to be careful invoking reason, rationality, and logic in any setting where magic is real. Because you don't want to do anything that jeopardizes someone's suspension of disbelief. And this is something I see a lot where you have, yes, but our technology is superior, but our magic is, is superior. And then they start spouting actual scientific things that make you start going, well, yeah, but then that means the magic can't happen. And <laughs> it, it, it creates a cognitive dissonance in me that I, I personally don't enjoy. Some people may enjoy it. If that's your bag, I don't kink shame anybody, but <laughs> so go for it. I just think that it would be, I, I, I'm very, I try to avoid that as much as I, as much as I can in my own fiction and worlds. Um, but I love a good rivalry between styles of magic. In fact, uh, the, one of the epic fantasy stories I'm currently working on, there are quite a few different branches of magic and practitioners have a very, uh, spirited rivalry between them. I would say, but yeah, I, I don't think that there's a real right or wrong answer there. I just, you have to be careful not to, when, whenever you're invoking logic, reason, and rationality and science in a world where real magic exists, you got to be careful not to pull people out of the world and keep them within it. That is a very good rule substitution. I like that a lot because all magic should have limitations. If you're creating a magic system with no limitations, you don't have a magic system. It does not become a system until, oh, but they can't do that. Until then, it's a magic license. It's not a magic system. And that's not what we're going for. Hello, Nikki. Your question is, how does someone even make a magic system? Okay, so like I said at the beginning, three simple rules. Three simple rules that you ask, your, ask yourself, what can it do, how is it utilized, and what can it not do? That's it. Now, a hard magic system goes way further into that than I think is often necessary. Again, like I said, I've seen some people that can pull it off, but the quickest way for a book to get into my I'm not finishing it <laughs> list, you know, my DNF is when all of a sudden I feel like I'm reading Moby Dick and it's just telling me about its magic system and only about its magic system. Because if I don't understand this thing, I won't understand what's going to happen later. I, I am not, which is weird. I have to say, which is like really weird because I like sitting here with a stack of guidebooks right next to me. I was going to start like parading them in front of the camera, but that's unnecessary. Like I literally have a stack of guidebooks right here that are nothing but world building for other settings. And I love reading those, but I'm reading those in and of themselves. They're not interrupting the flow of a novel because nothing gets more upsetting for me in reading a fantasy book then you're like right in the thick of things or your story is moving on. And then it's like, so now let me sit you down and explain to you the 32 ways that you can use magic water. Cause yeah, I, I've read that book. Well, I read up to that point in that book and somewhere around way 23, I was just like, maybe this is not the book for me. <laughs> Cause it's hard to make that interesting, especially if you've already gotten invested in somebody else's story. And dear God in heaven, please do not do that as a prologue 
to your book. This is why people skip prologues because especially in fantasy and science fiction, they have garnered a reputation of being nothing but filler there. Oh, here's my info dump on the backstory. I wish I could say that they didn't deserve that reputation, but they do <laughs> like most prologues do fit into that category. And if you have that category, that prologue in your book, changing its name isn't going to help you because the thing that we're upset about is I can't tell you how many books that I've read that begin with the thousand year history of the conflict. And while that may be important to know, not, not going to hook me at the beginning, pepper it in, pepper it in, give me a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit there, you know, even as dry as the Lord of the Rings can read. And trust me, I love my Tolkien. He did not start with a history of Morgoth and the dragons and Morgoth's defeat and the rise of Sauron and the defeat of Sauron and all of that. He doesn't, that's not how he tells his story. He doesn't go through all of the rigmarole of the whole thing. We start by meeting Frodo on the way and Gandalf on the way to Bilbo's birthday party, his 111th birthday party. Slowly we get the magic explained to us. Slowly we learn about the rings of men and the rings of elves and the rings of dwarves. Slowly we learn about these things and we under, start to understand it. That's the best way to do it. Find a way to seep it in because as much as I love Tolkien, he can be a little bit dry to read. But yeah, Nikki, if you want to create a magic system, tree, set up your rules. Make them in odd numbers because odd numbers are easy to remember. That's, that's the best thing that I can say about it. The other thing that I would also say, if you want to have some odd fun with it, I like when I'm thinking about magic to think about it in like quasi Jungian terms. And so I like to think, what are my gateway magics? In other words, what stands at the threshold? So do I have people who can call spirits, summon spirits, necromancy, right? So these would be your liminal magics. Then are there trickster magics? Are there illusion style magics? And then start going through the other primal archetypes, right? It, are there intellectual magics? Can people summon knowledge? from places are there emotional magics that can manipulate people are there um physical magics that can actually affect the world because you may have some all or none of those in your setting so ask yourself questions like that that that's also very very helpful <laughs> when you're coming up with a magic system hello vixens of fiction you're late, but ready to take notes. All right. So I've been talking about the styles of magic and kind of opened it up to questions. Cause like I said, I can prattle about this for the full time, but because there's so much to talk about, if you all have any specific questions, I would love to answer those as well. So Jules, Ooh, who fun. I love Carl Jung's archetypes and the hero cycle would be fun to go through as well to find magical elements and associations. Okay. So uh, as far as Joseph Campbell goes, one huge fan of, <laughs> of Joseph Campbell and have been an active member of the Joseph Campbell foundation for a while. Um, having said that he not only talked about the hero cycle, which is prominently known as the monomyth sometimes, which is kind of how a story works out. But he also talked about what he called the cosmogonic cycle, which is very simple. It's only got three parts to it. <laughs> but when you're doing your magic systems and kind of figuring out the history of magic or your gods or wherever magic comes from in your world might be good for you. And it's very simple. It takes the form of the analogy of a person who awakes, reaches their summit of power, 
falls back into sleep and dreams. So it has four phases. Where does where did things arise from? What is their peak? What is their fading? And when are they no more? When are they gone back into that realm of dream, which will be either complete dissolution or annihilation, or it could be a place where everything is renewed and given much more vibrant life. And that this cosmogonic cycle is included in every, I'm going to say every tradition that we have, because even in science, we talk about the big bang, right? We have the, the singularity, which is on the first line, right? Right there where everything first comes into being. We have the singularity. The singularity gives us the big bang and the big bang expands out into the universe and the cosmos as we know it through all of the energies of you know, dark, dark energy pushing everything out to continuously expand gravity, trying to pull everything back in. We have the electromagnetic and the weak and strong forces all battling it out over the fate of the particles that are in the universe. But at some point, either gravity wins. So this is your option on the other end, right? Either gravity wins and everything gets pulled back together into a big crunch or dark energy wins and everything moves out completely. Depending on which of those two you have at this end, when we come back down on our loop, we then have our dissolution, which is either the heat death of the universe where everything fades out back into evenness or everything gets crushed back into a new singularity that will then explode again out into the, out into the cosmos. So even scientifically, we have these four points in our cycle. So they're not just part of mythology. They're just a cultural artifact of how we understand the world, how it came into being and how it will eventually be dissolved. And so thinking about your magic in that way can also be helpful because those cycles get repeated in the phases of the moon, in the um, wheel of the year, and in the cycles of life. So he talks about that a lot. And I don't hear a lot of people talking about that part of his idea, of his uh, philosophy. Vixens of Fiction says, how specific do soft magic systems need to be? What are some tricks to keep from cheating when using a soft magic, when using soft magic? I love this question. Okay. I, I I personally prefer soft magic systems in my writing, though my epic fantasy actually has a hard magic system in it that will never be explained to anybody. And I mean it will not probably it, it will not be included in a book in its totality, but I have fun writing documents in a setting and I actually wrote up some stuff. But to answer your question, make rules as if you're playing a game. I think this is the way that I get this from my love of tabletop role-playing games. But this is one of the places where that really, really comes into play and can be very, very, very handy in making your systems work. So think about it as if you were designing a game system so let's see if you were to establish a rule how wide how expansive should it be think of this maybe in numbers the reason i'm kind of hemming and hawing is i'm pulling up a website now i'm not all right here we go so over on collaborativeworldbuilding.com, this wonderful, wonderful website, you will find a copy of a link to um, Trent's book, which is a marvelous book, but not one that you necessarily have to procure. It is more a book that will help you if you're actually wanting to do world building with other people. The main thing that's really fun is the cards. So if you go, go to that website, you click resources, you click the cards, there are world building cards that you can buy and world building cards that you can um, print out. So depending on how you want to support them or not, or the money that you have or not, because I bought a copy of the book because I wanted to read it and I bought the, I, I 
printed out the cards because I did not have the money. So the way this works is you can, when you're assigning things, and this works for even your cultures in the setting, assign a value between one to five. So, and it's up to you what one and five mean. So if you want to play by golf rules where one is is highest, play by golf rules. If five's highest, play by that. However you want to see these numbers, let them mean what they mean to you. There's, that, there's no hard and fast rules on that. But anything that scores a five is the most. And anything that scores a one is the least. Now, when you're doing your magic system and you say, so eh, all, let's go to she who shall not be named, right? All magic requires a wand. Human magic requires a wand. Well, we would have to set that rule at maybe a three or a four. It's not a five, right? Because it's not actually 100% true. All magic doesn't require a wand. And I'm not, not just talking about like things that we see the house elves and the goblins do. We see humans use magic without wands. They have to be very powerful, which is why I said that's a five, four or a five as far as how strict the rule is. But by allowing yourself to set your system up that way, you can tell yourself, this is a rule that's this true. And as long as you stick to the meanings that you ascribe there, you're not going to A, allow yourself to fall victim to power creep as easily, because power creep is a big problem in fantasy that we need to deal with. And also, you don't have to then explain everything. Because say you're doing your elements, right? So elemental magic has a rating of say, say three. So beginners can't really do it. But then we break that down further because say five fire has a rating of five because of the inherent danger of wielding fire. Only masters can use it. Do you see what I'm saying? Allow, allowing yourself to think in those terms might be very helpful. It's a thing that I often do <laughs> when I'm creating my magic systems. The other thing to give to these that he recommends, which I find is fun, is, is this number trending or stable? If it's stable, then it's pretty much set in stone, right? This, th this thing that we're talking about is at this level and it's just going to stay there. If it's trending, it could be getting harder because maybe that access to that kind of magic is going away or for some other reason becoming more difficult, or it could be trending easier because some event in your story is making that kind of magic more powerful. And those are fun things to play with. It's a very simple, straightforward setup for how to think about world building. And I really like his methodology there because it allows you to set up rules fairly quickly. And actually the point of the cards is if you need to create a culture, their actual culture cards already built into the deck and that you just print them out. And then when you, you pull them out and then like playing solitaire, you shuffle out the cards, the number of cards on top of them and have a pre-made culture like instantly. But it's, it's a good way to think about it. Because that, that's how I like to do it. But you don't have to do that for everything. As long as you have a firm enough knowledge on how to play with the magic, you're good. And a, actually, let me backtrack that. It's a better way to say it. As long as your readers will not be confused by why a magical event occurred, you have defined, explained your magic well enough. Because remember, all of this is about the reader. As much as we want to make our world building and all of that creative work about ourselves, it's not. We are really working for our readers and making, <laughs> giving stories that our readers can rely on. So the better it is, as long as it's understandable to the reader why the thing happened, you did, you did good. That's all you need to worry about. That's literally all you need to worry about. And if you kind of try to limit your world building to that, it will keep you from having world builders disease like so many of us do, where all we want to do is world build. Because, <laughs> oh, all the shiny ideas. 
Visions of Fiction asks, he says, I'm using Moon Phases, Monthly, Annual, and, and um, Centennial, and lunar, the Lunar Solar Cycle. That's really cool. I, um, Artifexian's channel has a really interesting video on creating Luni Solar calendars on it, where he actually links to a Google Doc, a, no, a Google Sheet, that you can copy and make use for your own to actually set up a, an accurate lunar solar calendar for use. That would be really helpful in figuring a lot of that out. It actually helps you calculate leap days and leap years and all that. The video actually explains how to use it. Um, and if you want, I can find that and link it into the chat. But actually, I'll just do a search for it real quick. But that might be something that you want to look at. I think that doing something, doing something like that is really fun. And again, this is where I get to show my <laughs> love of tabletop role-playing games. The first thing that actually came to mind is the uh, Dragonlance and the Three Moons of Kryn and exactly how they play out and how they work in setting and in the world and how they affect magic and how fun that was the first time i read it as a kid because i really really like that so there is a link to artifexian's video on how to set up your own lunar solar lunar solar calendar which takes into effect both the moon and the sun and that video itself has the link to his calendar builder spreadsheet that's on there as well as the how to do the composite numbers necessary for it the video walks you through it he actually talks about how to make just a lunar calendar and a solar calendar in the vi two videos he made prior to that so that might be something that could be very very helpful in doing that i really think if especially if you're tying magic to seasons and cycles of the moon unless your story is happening on earth i think you should have as much fun as you can coming up with how the planets how the moons how the constellations whatever it is that's affecting your magic actually applies and by creating something like a, a your own functional calendar you can really have fun with it. In my epic fantasy, for example, they have a four-year cycle that dominates the world. And every four years, they have a leap month, a 13th month of that gets added to the um to to the to the schedule to bring the solar and lunar dates back into alignment. And I spent quite some time working on the calendar to get it to work. And it's a lot of fun. And as such, I can tell you the moon, because I, I did that no matter what year in setting, I can tell you the moon phase and the uh, season very, very accurately with that. <laughs> and I'm very excited about that because that's a nice thing to be able to do. Cause I can have that accuracy and consistency throughout the, the stories and i rather enjoy that it makes me it makes me have it makes me really 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 happy i like doing that um okay so if you are somebody with world building disease like me and apparently vixens of fiction now they are not uh, they are anything but a sponsor of mine because i give them a lot of money and they don't pay me at all but I highly recommend that you look at a site and service like World Anvil for the main reason that they, I think you have to be a guild member to turn it on, but once you do, they allow you to link things like your Patreon and coffee accounts to the world building articles that you're doing. For example, mine are in the description box below. Um, <laughs> And I have actually found that some people do who have, I don't know what the companion to a uh, world building disease is, who would like to go through and read your world building articles will actually do that. They will uh, 
donate to your coffee and to your Patreon and help you to continue world building because that's a thing that they enjoy reading. So there actually is a, I don't want to say necessarily a career path or a publishing path because I don't think it's that clear yet for people like us who have the world builders disease, but it's actually a thing that I'm working towards actually being able to explain. And I like, I like having options where I can tell my stories and people can help support them and help keep them coming. So I think there is actually a future for those of us who have world builders disease to be able to do that. <laughs> so hopefully that works. And I see two thanks in here and you're welcome. You're welcome. But if you see, I think magic systems are the main place where people develop their world build builders disease. Because once you start thinking about what the rules of magic are, you want to make sure that you have them right. Sweeties, please listen to your BB. There's no right answer. <laughs> You're creating this world. The only right answer is that your rules stay consistent throughout your story, your series, and your setting. Because consistency makes things feel true. That's all you need is consistency. So you don't have to know every little thing. You just need to know enough to explain what's going on and not to con contradict rules once you've established them. Like having Molly Weasley wave her wand and make food appear all the time and then to be like, oh no, you can't wave your wand and make food appear. Joe. <laughs> See, you've got two, two moons. Fake creatures have magic and the lun lunar cycles affects magic strength. Um, th things that can be done. Okay, so with multiple moons, there are some fun things that you could do with that, such as what happens if the two moons come in conjunction? Can they come into conjunction? Exactly how are they aligned? Because not all moons actually orbit on the same orbital, orbital plane. So that's another thing to bear in mind, is you may have one moon that orbits this way and one moon that orbits that way. It's rare. It is rare in reality, but that does happen where moons do not always orbit in the same, um, the same plane. Earth has, if you want to count them, technically three moons. Um, one is the one that you know that you see when you look out in the sky, but we actually have two um, asteroids that we have captured in our planet's gravity that orbit our planet but they don't orbit actually on the same ecliptic plane that the moon does. And they're actually further away than the moon, but they are captured in our gravity and are winding their way around the planet. So there are ways that you can do that and ways that you can play with that to really have a lot of fun. And, you know, there, there's always the standards, your equinoxes, your eclipses, your solstices and all that, that you can really have a lot of fun with when you're playing with it. But asking yourself how the two moons interact is one thing. And not to get off on a world building, like a, a world world building thing, asking yourself how that affects tides is also going to be a very important thing for your setting because they the two moons would actually be competing over the height that the water gets to. So when they're on opposite sides of the planet, they would actually create super tides so if there was a way that the moon could be a, on either side of the planet at, a, at once, because when a moon pulls the water up on one side, it actually bulges out on the back side of the planet. If you had two moons doing that, that would actually amplify the effect. So there may actually be places that would have almost dry land during a conjunction like that, that would not have it normally. And you would have places that would be thoroughly inundated with water and flooded that would not happen normally. So bear that in mind, if you, depending on how much of that sort of thing you want to build into your world and setting, but that's some stuff that you can really play around with when you have multiple moons, because 
m most of the time you're going to have them have a similar orbital period so that that doesn't happen too much but that is a thing that could rarely occur if they're not in if they're not tidally locked into a synchronous orbit with each other which given how you're describing them affect magic they probably aren't so Bear stuff like that in mind. There are a lot of fun things that you can do with celestial bodies if you want to play around with it. And trust me, you can do all the math if you want to, but you don't have to do all the math. As long as you have, as long as you play by the established rules of how the world actually wor works and how people understand the world to work, you can get by with a lot. Because one, there will always be somebody who checks your math. It happens. And if they think that you've done wrong, they will tell you. And even if you didn't do it wrong, it, it, they'll tell you. Because that's how people are. So don't worry about having to do like all the math and stuff to figure that out. If that's something that would stress you out. But there's a lot of fun things that you could do that wise. Yeah, I kind of got distracted in that. Sorry. I just Can you tell I really like world building? Like, this is a thing that I love doing with, like, all my heart and soul and energy. It's, it's, it's so much fun. And magic even doubly so, because one of the things that doesn't get talked about enough when we talk about magic is the styles in which magic can be employed in your world. So magic can exist on multiple levels. It can be just a subtle thing that happens in the ba background like what you would see in Western fa fabulism or in uh, magic realism stories, where it is just an assumed part of the setting that is almost cultural in the way that it manifests and not drawn out at all. But in stories like that, you don't have things like spellcasters. You just have what would normally be seen as supernatural, just as a natural point of the world then you would have kind of your low fantasy worlds where you may have specific forms of magic existing here, there, and yonder. And then your high fa fantasy worlds where magic is a lot more common. Now, when you're figuring out what level of magic you want to have in your world, please bear one thing in mind. Everyone would have access to some form of magic if magic does exist, with a few exceptions. If magic is required if you're required to have a specific bloodline to have magic, do be careful. <laughs> do be careful. Many, not all, but many stories that try to do that fall into the trap of making white supremacist and racist arguments that many times the authors do not intend to be making. This is actually one of the things that really undercuts the storyline of the Harry Potter books and the wizarding books in general is Voldemort's technically not wrong about m wizards being superior to other people. They are magic is not something that can just be learned. It's something you have to be born with and being born with. It does make you special. Now the way he goes about it is completely wrong, but it does undermine the basic arguments of the book and the series that at least the basic underpinning of his premise is is true. So be careful with things like that. And I'm not saying the magic can't exist like that. There are fun ways to do it. Having it being locked to specific types of creatures is helpful. Uh, in my urban fantasy setting, there are the creatures that are born with magic. So the dragons, the fae, and things like that, that are born with magic, but they can bestow magical powers on others via covenant because I really like Pact with the Devil kinds of stories. And so this is the origin of the Pact with the Devil stories, because it's a it, it's a contemporary urban fantasy, so it takes place in our world. And so that's why you had those stories, because back in the day, people made deals with the dragons and the fae and the giants, and were able to actually use magic. So they're able to share their power. And there are fun ways to do that. So I'm not saying that it's a total mm, don't do it, no go, but it's a please be careful. Please be careful because it's very easy, very, very easy to accidentally say something you don't mean to be saying when you're doing that sort of a thing. 
Um, let's see. Th thank you. Looks like those astronomy classes may come in handy. Who do? Uh, yeah. Astronomy classes come in very handy when you're doing things, especially when it comes to magic and whatnot, because if you've ever studied any of the actual um, schools of occultism that exist in the real world and any of the styles of magic that exist. Um, I have these out because I just did a podcast on Illuminism, which is a style of magic that is designed to gain enlightenment that very few fantasy authors actually use. Um, just did a podcast on that that's available on the Myth Weaving uh, podcast. But if you've never actually looked at the ways that magic is actually studied in real cultures, it often has to deal with constellations and with alchemy and all of these things kind of intersperse and interplay with each other so that they can work and they're very powerful. Um. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Yeah. We've been talking about a lot of stuff. Um, It is a lot. It is a lot. That's one of the reasons why I wanted questions because some someone asked me to do an episode on magic systems and I think I'm six episodes in. I, I don't know how many have actually, because they, they're scheduled and recorded ahead of time. So I don't know how many are actually up yet, but I think I'm six episodes in. And I keep thinking of, oh, but we haven't talked about that yet, or that yet, or that yet. There's a lot to talk about here, and it really <laughs> could go on forever if I'm not careful. And I need to be very careful thereabouts that I don't just go on forever, because I really could. I really, really could. Um, <laughs> but yeah, anytime that you're, anytime you're looking at how magic is actually employed in the real world, how magic, how the various hermetic schools, how the Greeks and Romans, Egyptians, and others actually employ them. You have things from the various folk magic, the talismans that would have been made that people just had and would go and get and have around their house. Magic was a very integral to the cultures of, the, of our world and still is to this day, extremely integral to the stories that we have in this world. I, I showed this on Glory's um, panel yesterday. But let me pull, see if I can pull it up again real quick. There's a book that is not cheap. Can I make that bigger? Yes, I can. Um, by Joseph A. Jo Josephson Storm called The Myth of Disenchantment. That this is... This is an actual college textbook. If you do, um, if you study magic in seminary or in college, this is actually one of the textbooks that you will study from. <laughs> so it's not exactly a cheap book, but it's one that I highly recommend, especially if you're doing anything that's about the collision between science and magic, because there was a concerted effort to sanitize a lot of history and a lot of modern stories about how our societies are to make it look like there is this, oh, but rational people don't believe in astrology and tarot and moon phases and ghosts and uh, talismans and various other magical supernatural occurrences. And what's very interesting about this book in particular is he comes with receipts where they've done surveys and they're using surveys in a lot of European countries as well as in America, showing that the correlation, the assumed correlation between religiosity and superstition or belief in magical effects is not, they're not connected. Those are completely disjointed experiences in the human psyche. So, just because you are in a highly technologically advanced civilization, it does not follow that you will necessarily be free from people having, you know, magic, you know, having talismans, 
and magical tinctures and potions and things like that in, in their life because those things do overlap to a much higher degree than people give them credit for. And it, it's a very interesting book to read. And if you want to see an interview about that religion for the channel, YouTube channel, which is where I found it from a religion for breakfast did an interview with him as well as an, a, a talk about the ideas in this book. So you can, Check that out if you want some more information and not have to buy. I think it's, I can't remember how much it is. I think it's like a $20 ebook to get. It's not a cheap ebook, but it's very, very handy, especially if you're thinking about having that kind of a dichotomy story because it's not a prescriptive book. It's not saying this is how it should be. It's a descriptive book saying that the this myth that science came up and cast out all the superstitions that's not how that works. And that's not the reality that we see in societies. And it's really interesting to see how it actually plays out and how the, what the numbers actually look like and all that. It's, it's, it, it's, it's interesting <laughs> if that's something that you want to get into. Um, let's see, you just watched a video about it. It said that it was better to establish, um, said it was better to establish racism as a concept through things like rumors, misconceptions about other people. Don't make it. Yes. Don't make it into being more powerful than others. Yes. Um, there's actually a really, Oh, thank you for that. De I see Devin just put a link to it in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. I, I meant to pull that up, but I did. No one's going to talk about it. And I forgot to pull it up over on Amazon. Yeah, there, uh, Jack Saint has done a couple very interesting things about animals as metaphors for racism that I would also recommend that you watch, where he talks about B stars and he did one on Zootopia and how a lot of the metaphors that we use for race are inherently problematic. Because if you actually look at something like Zootopia, while it's an interesting movie with an interesting message to it, they did decide to make the people that are the stand in for African Americans in American culture predators. And everyone else is an herbivore or prey. And that has knock on effects to the way <laughs> everything is perceived. And that's something just to be considering when you are developing your stories and how you want to actually have your messages come across. Because I think a lot of us are writing stories about, and you know, gender sexuality and um, gender identity and race, especially right now, because it's very fresh in our consciousness. And we have to be careful when we use any kinds of metaphors at all, that we're not sending mixed messages. It should never remember the power imbalances that exist in all of those situations should be one of legal rights and not one of magical capacity. Cause that's where that's one of the few play. One of the main places racism gets built into a magic system is people will say, Oh, but those kinds of people can't have magic. Now it's different when it's species kind of, that's a whole other bag of worms. But so, you know, it's different when like all Fae have access to magic, but all humans do not, unless we're making a race analogy there. So be very careful with that. And also, please be careful colonizing other people's cultures for sake of magic in your own. I, I, this is a big pet peeve of mine where you see somebody who doesn't know anything about juju or voodoo or um, <laughs> gri gri or any of the African religions that I often see played off in stories for effect or what have you. There are a lot of Asian faiths that also get um, abused in this manner. If you don't have knowledge of it, I'm not saying that you can't use it. I'm just saying if you don't have knowledge of it, educate yourself so that you don't say things that are insulting. If you were basing your magic off of someone else's culture, 
or off of, even if it's your own culture and you don't have a firm understanding of it, that can really be problematic to readers who have a better understanding. So just, just be very mindful of that, not to colonize somebody else's culture for your own artistic benefit and pleasure. This happened a lot when I was a child where, oh, we want to have magic and mysticism. So let's throw a, I'm going to say Native American in, that's not the words that they would have used at the time, into the story. And they are the embodiment of all that is magic. And oh yeah, and they're all the same. And there's only really one group of people. Yeah, the racism was extremely bad <laughs> with a lot of that. And it has continued. I mean, she who shall not be named had a problem with that when she started writing stuff that took place in, in the Americas. And yeah, just be careful not to accidentally colonize somebody else's culture for the sake of your own magic. That that's, that's beyond problematic. <laughs> that is just beyond problematic and is something that we should really, really avoid at all costs. All right. So, in about 13 minutes, the closing ceremony will be happening over on the virtual writing Ren Fairs channel. So does, does anybody have any final questions before I close this? People can go over there for that. And I'm loading this up so I can see what I'll see. I'm going to load up the YouTube YouTube itself so I can see the chat because it can take time sometimes for StreamYard to catch up. I see Devin just put the link in for the closing ceremony, so I don't have to. Thank you so much for that, Devin. I don't see any more questions coming in, so I will take it that you don't have any right now. I will say if you have any for me, I am easy to reach on both... Um, Twitter and Instagram. I am C Dorson on both. You can find links in the description to but my Twitter and my Instagram. And definitely check out my podcast, Myth Weaving, for more on these topics. I go into a lot, a lot more detail, especially on magic systems and other things. If you go back to episode one of that podcast, it is a deep dive into building a world from scratch. So we start with nothing and we go through everything to getting a mag a world built. It's been a lot of fun doing that. The other cool thing about the podcast is the host that I have in the show notes for each pod episode of the podcast, you'll find a link for the voice message system. So you can send me a one minute voicemail with your questions to be answered on the show. So if you have any further questions, that's a good place to do it. Or if you want me to do a YouTube video about it, hit me up on social media and ask, and I will gladly do it because I love talking about these things and I want to be of use. All right. So let's take a look at the chat real quick. And you are welcome. I hope that everybody really enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe down below. Um, I will be doing a lot more world building stuff. I don't know when that's going to be starting. I have some plans, but I will also be prioritizing any requests that I get. So if I get specific questions, I'll be prioritizing that over the ideas that I have for world building content for this channel. So definitely subscribe because that will be coming in the future. And you're welcome, J JLC. And welcome to my channel. I've not seen you here before. Just wanted to say thank you again. I'm glad that you enjoyed it. I'm glad that I could be at, of help. No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do streams every Wednesday and Friday over on, well, over on, on this channel. And they, I will have the schedule fixed for that next week. They usually start around four. I may be moving the Wednesday. I'm oh, sorry, five. I could do it Eastern time, five o'clock Eastern. And I may be pushing that back an hour on Wednesday. But if you want to do writing sprints with me, I do them then. I have my Mill Wordy episode um, that comes out every Tuesday here. And I've got my Project Shadow podcast, which is of all of these available in the podcast engines that you enjoy listening to. 
Project Shadow is pretty much about whatever I feel like talking about. It's often about books, movies, music, and TV that I like. I have Myth Weaving, which is my podcast about world building and writing. And I have my newest podcast, which is exclusive to Spotify, which is called House of the Blue Dragon. And it is about music. And I actually get to not only talk about music, but play music on the show. Thanks to the wonderful folks at Spotify. I am lining up some interviews with some musicians and bands to be on that show. And I could not be happier with it. So thank you all so much for coming. I really hope that you have enjoyed. Thank you for the subscription. That's awesome. It This was a lot of fun, and I want to do more stuff like this in future. So, alrighty. As I like to end everything on my channel, because everything's a mess right now, remember, remember always, Black Lives Matter, trans identities are valid. Be out there, be loud, be proud, be yourself. We can change this world for the better if we all stay together. And may you all have the courage to ride your dreams into reality. And don't forget to have the fun. Bye. Oh,